Hi everybody, it's Kim at Kay Becker's Books, and I've got some funky lighting in a different area that I'm filming in, just trying to get some quiet and some privacy, so it's a little, little off. So I hope it works out, but today I am here, as per my title, to give you my pointless May wrap-up. And I say it's pointless because um, for so many different reasons, May was, was just a crappy reading month for me. <laughs> But I did want to post some content, and I have a couple things to say. So um, let's let's get into it. I had a, a really rough reading month. I only finished five books this month, which is much lower than my average, which is not trying to boast, but it just is. And I really like to read more than that because I love to read every day. However, I did have several DNFs that I think led into that that number, and I will go over those. But before I do that, I did finish one additional book for the month. I, I can link my um, mid-May review below because it already has the, the previous four books in that that I read. But this one I, I read for um, the 2020 Asian Readathon. I read The Vegetarian by Han Kang. Han Kang? I'm not sure of the pronunciation, so we're going we're gonna to go with that. Um, this is a very slim novel and I know that it's been everywhere so I'm not this is nothing new but when I read the reviews and I read the description of this book I was I was actually very surprised at the number of reviews that didn't seem to get it didn't seem to get the book or didn't like it because of the reasons why or the topic that they thought the book was about this is not about being a vegetarian and it's not about uh, vegetarianism. It's, it goes um, much deeper than that for such a short book. It's put it, it's written in three sections. The um, beginning section is the story of Yang Hai. She and her husband live in an ordinary life. Um, this is set in Korea and the distinct tone of the first third of the book is her husband. This is not a marriage based on love or passion or any of that. It's a marriage based on expectation. And that's basically the theme of the novel is, is their family and their societal expectations. They marry because, you know, it's a good thing to do and it's a good idea. He, he thinks of her that she is meek and quiet and won't cause any trouble. Uh, she's a good housekeeper. She's a good cook. So he thinks, yeah, why not? It seems like a good combination and he, he wants and needs to get married. So that's why he does that. However, he's, he's pretty much a tyrant towards her. He's extremely insulting, verbally abusive, emotionally abusive, does not take her feelings into consideration. He's expecting a typical wife expectations. And eventually she starts to have dreams, very vivid, grotesque, macabre dreams about death and animals and blood. And she stops eating meat because of it. She's convicted and determined based on these dreams. He, of course, lays into her even, even more with, with insults and degradation and humiliation. He ends up sexually assaulting her. Um, he thinks that she's crazy and that she's nothing. And eventually she is brought to a hospital and upon her admit admittance to a psychiatric hospital, he leaves her. But her vegetarianism is not about not wanting to eat meat or doing it for a medical or even a societal reason. It is her way of kind of sticking it to the expectations that are put upon her from her family and the society she lives in. The second third of the book is comes from the perspective of her brother-in-law, her sister's husband. The third section of the book is comes directly from her sister. I thought it was it the the book to me started off in a brilliant way with the first section. I also enjoyed the second section. I thought it was um, weird and um, unique. It was also quite unrealistic. Maybe that was a part of what was so good about it. 
And then the last section from the point of view of her sister was much more of a pragmatic explanation about how the characters got to that point. Um, so I really, it's, to me it started off brilliantly and it ended well, but I gave this a four star. I really enjoyed it. Really liked diving into the themes of the book of societal expectations. Um, the author also wrote this in response to a massacre and political unrest in um, her area of the world. And I thought it was a really good way to expose that and to express it. That was the only other book that I finished in May. Um, I started four books that I DNF'd and hopefully very quickly. The first one is A Personal Matter by Ken Kenabiro Owe. Um, I didn't get very far. I probably got 60 or 70 pages. At, at the point in the book where they were discussing a rape between the main character and a former girlfriend, and talking about it as if it was it a really a rape or was it not i at i said nope i can't i can't read anymore and those two characters were former lovers boyfriend girlfriend and he the main character is married and his wife has just given birth to a baby boy with a brain malformation so i i really hated i hated the story the writing was good, and the book was written in 19, published in 1969. I thought it was just, um, it was, it was difficult to read the, the fairly misogynistic perspective of the story and the author, and it just did not work for me. Um, another book that I read for the Asian Readathon, and I was really optimistic about this one, it's Rain Birds by Clarissa Gowenawan. And she is an Indonesian Singaporean writer. Um, it's the story of a of a young woman who dies suddenly, and her her younger brother who starts to investigate what happened, starts to look into her background. It it is very much reminds me of a Murakami novel, and I would assume that this author is a big fan of his, and I am not. So I I actually got kind of bored. It's a um, very bland male protagonist, and his dead sister is the much more interesting character. So I, I, I gave up. Unfortunately, this next DNF was supposed to be a buddy read with Sarah, who does not have a channel, but she is a subscriber and a commenter and a booktube prize judge. This is If You Want to Make God Laugh by Bianca Moraes. And I'm really looking forward to buddy reading this, and I recently hauled it, um but I could not stand the writing in this book. And I'm gonna link a video from Greg of Supposedly Fun. He reviewed this book in a, in a wonderful way and I completely agree with everything he said, even though I didn't even read the book, I read the first 50 pages. I hated her writing style. So many um, cliches and stereotypes and, just the way she was writing and describing and the adjectives and all of it, I could not stand it. And I was so apologetic to Sarah. It's like, I'm really sorry, but I have to bail early on this book. Um, nope, could not do it. And this last DNF, I just started it a couple of days ago. And this is for my upcoming Critical Chicks book group on Friday. And this is Shirley Jackson's Life Among the Savages. This is a very short memoir of her family moving from the city to a big deserted house in Vermont. She talks about her relationship with with the city to begin with, how she and her husband decide to go to this small town in Vermont, what they think they're going to live like when they get there. It starts off that she has, they have a three-year-old son and a, a, a an eight-month-old baby daughter Eventually, she they end up having four children in total. But this was published in the 50s. Let me see if I can get an exact year. It was originally published in 1948, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53 by Shirley Jackson. Uh, extremely stereotypical, male-centric, traditional storyline of a 50s housewife, of a white 50s housewife. And I just... I was not interested in that point of view. 
I, I love Shirley Jackson's writing, but this was just not a book that I would enjoy. And I think it's, I got 40, 40 ish pages into the book and, and, and just sadly had to give it up. I hate when I don't read the book group book, but I really disliked it. Um, let's see. May was also maybe Midrash and I'll, I'll post my, this video below as well. I did a review of two books that I read for maybe Midrash was, the first one was In This House of Breed by Rumor Godden, which was fiction. And, um, Finally Feminist by John Stackhouse Jr., the, the, which was nonfiction, which I did not like. And Rumor Godden's book, In This House of Breed, I really did enjoy. And I am going to finish, I have not yet finished my second two Midrash books, but I will, and I am currently reading them. And I look out for another video for those because I am going to finish those. And they are um kathleen norris's the cloister walk this is a non-fiction novel novel it's non-fiction book and kathleen norris uh became an oblate for a benedictine monastery and she studied with and worked with monks so it i'm still i'm i think i am 114 pages in there's probably around 300 pages in the book and um really fascinating topic. It's a little bit different than what I was expecting because Kathleen Norris is a writer and a poet and she talks a lot about poetry and art and her life through this book. And I think she does that a little bit more than what I was expecting, but I really enjoy the writing and I enjoy the, the vignettes about her interaction with the monks and her interactions and experiences at a monastery. So I will continue and I will finish that. My fiction, my next fiction for maybe Midrash is The Sparrow by Mary Doria Russell. And I've got my the jacket out in the other room because I took it off to read the book, which I rarely do. But on this one, I did. And this is, I am 75 pages into this one. And this is a science fiction novel. And the main, the main male protagonist is a Jesuit priest. There's, it, it's a, it goes back and forth in time. And it talks about his his kind of mission on a foreign planet or a foreign civilization. So I will also finish that. And like I said, I will have a separate maybe Midrash video for those two books. So those are two of what I'm currently reading. The other ones, I have two others that I'm currently reading. Love in a Fallen City by Eileen Chang, which is a short story collection. I'm gonna I'm picking away at this one a little bit at a time. There was a third story, which unfor unfortunately was the title story, Love in a Fallen City, which I really disliked, skimmed through, and really did not want to finish it. But I am going to continue and finish the collection. The other one that I am currently reading, which I'm really enjoying, is P.S. I Love You by Cecilia Ahern, who is an Irish writer. And there's a movie on this book, um, P.S. I Love You, which stars Hilary Swank and Gerard Butler. And it's one of my favorite feel-good movies. I've, I've watched it a dozen times over the years. The book is much more, much more different than the movie, which is interesting. And I almost never watched the movie first. But I honestly saw the movie years ago and didn't realize it was from a book. And I found this for a dollar at a library sale. I'm like, oh, I think I really enjoy reading that. And so far I am enjoying it. Um, it's the story of Holly and her husband, Jerry, who just passed away from a brain tumor. And it's right in the beginning of the book. And it talks about her grief process and her relationship with her family and friends and how how they're dealing with it as well as assisting her in this process. What she does after Jerry, the love of her life, has died. And it's funny and romantic and just feel good. And it's honestly fairly well written. I really like how she writes it. Um... It, a lot of dialogue, a lot of interaction between characters, and it's fun. So I really, uh, really am enjoying that one. And that's kind of the one out of the four that I'm currently reading that I'm going to more often. And I think it's simply because of the what's happening around me and the environment, the political and the social environment. I'm going more towards a fun book, something that I'm enjoying that's I can I want to sit and keep reading a, big chunks of it at a time. Um, it's been really difficult this month, and at first it was purely based on COVID-19 pandemic issues, but 
in the last few weeks, in the last few weeks, there's been a magnification about what's happening with um, with black men and black Black Lives Matter and all of those those issues um, of our current political climate and our endemic racism that we're we're seeing visually in the media. But I can't ignore, and I hope none of us ignore, the things that are happening in the black community. I, I've i decided, and I showed a picture of a pile of books that I recently posted, that I am going to do the one little thing that I can do and self-educate myself on the topics of racism and um, the experiences of black communities and the experiences of people who have to be daily afraid of their authorities and afraid to walk out the door and what black people have to teach their children in order to survive. People can't, black people cannot even be in their own homes safely without being shot at or without being mistaken for somebody else from what the claims have been. They can't feel confident that their voices are going to be heard, not just in an individual way, but in a global political movement type of way. Um, Brian from Bookish posted a wonderfully articulate video uh, challenging white men in power, and I'll link that as well. He was very, very articulate and succinct about the fact that it will take white men to stand up and speak out and to move this process forward. Because admittedly, white men are the ones who are primarily in power, not just in our country, but for the most part internationally around the world. And this is not bashing anybody, but I agree with him that I would love to see the people that are currently in power step out far more often than what they're doing now. I've been so surprised at our administration and hoping for some of our Republican leadership, which is the party that is in primary power at the moment, to step out and finally say the emperor has no clothes. I, I can't really understand or, or justify in my head why or how nobody's done that yet. So I, I feel so I feel mournful for families of black people who have been victims of murder or brutality. I am embarrassed at our country's leadership. I constantly shake my head in just speechlessness and incredulity. I, I just say to myself sometimes, I can't believe this. So the one small step I can take right now is to start to educate myself. And it's not that I haven't done that before, but I'm, I'm making an active and conscious effort to choose the direction of information that I want and to choose and actively seek out information that will teach me and show me and speak to me so that I can have a much better understanding of people around me who need voices, who need their voices to be heard, who need us to have a better understanding of what their reality is. And maybe we can do the other next easiest thing we can do and, and vote, vote our convictions and vote to make change. This is not also a challenge to get everybody to go out and vote. But since I've been an adult, I've voted and I can't remember, I can't think of any other time in history where I think my vote is more powerful. And I can't think of any other time in my adult life where I have been so unbelievably sad, angry, embarrassed, horrified all at once at a president who I did not vote for. And I, I, I don't remember feeling this way about any other president that I did not vote for. In my opinion, for the most part, they've been decent people who are trying to do what they can. They have their agendas. I'm aware of that. But I've never felt this way. I've never felt hopeless politically. 
and that that sprinkle that shred of hope comes in November and that's kind of what I'm looking forward to in the meantime I'm going to pay attention I'm going to read I'm going to educate myself I'm going to look for those other small things that I as a as a white citizen of this country as an individual can do and I'm going to choose to do those things I'm going to express my support publicly for the black lives movement in a way that is not intrusive to them and I will continue to do those little things that I can do to show my compassion my support and my sorrow so it's been a rough month for it's been a rough month for many of us who are looking in on the outskirts and the distraction the the sadness everything all of it the empathy and feeling powerless so those things that usually provide me and us joy those hobbies those things that um, are usually fun seem kind of trite at this point in history seem kind of pointless and so i can feel bad about not reading so much but i don't really because my mind is too distracted and I'm too consumed with taking some action, taking some small steps forward. So that's it for today. I will have another video soon, hopefully. And uh, I get my hair cut on Thursday. I'm really excited about that. We see things starting to reopen now and it's, it's, it's hopeful and it's optimistic and still being careful, still being cautious. Um, but I'm looking forward to that. So hope you're having a good day. Um, I look forward to making another video and talking with you soon. Write a comment below if you have anything you want to say about my books or what I just said or anything at all. I look forward to having those conversations. Take care. See you in the next video. Bye.